This video is sponsored by Crimson Manifesto, Knuckles OX, and Baba Snake. If the human Z fighters became androids, or rather cyborgs, with mechanical augmentations and infinite energy or even energy absorption capabilities, they'd become incredibly relevant during the android slash cell saga and far, far beyond, with only a minuscule amount of training, honestly. In juxtaposition to the Saiyan version of this story I've done as a mainline what if, Yantu would be the first to think of this after hearing Trunks' warning, seeing him reason that if human enemies of such a description fought without proper training, he'd thought of them without their enhancements, meaning this android procedure must be pretty powerful. And if anyone could replicate tech like that, it'd be Boma. So why fight fair when he and his human buddies could just fight fire with fire? And use the Dragon Balls to go back to normal if they didn't like it, pushing Boma to come up with her own version of cybernetic augmentation and make Yamcha the first Capsule Corp android. When the androids arrive, Goku and the others are all pretty shocked by the news, but beyond thrilled when it results in Yamcha easily dispatching both Dr. Jiro and Android 19. Finding his lab and three more androids, they decide to give them a chance and let Boma work her magic to deprogram them. This, however, gives Cell an opening to become perfect, but now that Yamcha has proven the android procedure worth it and motivated the Saiyans to push past Super Saiyan even faster, it's likely the bio android has to deal with multiple stronger androids than anything Dr. Jiro could hope to make, and possibly even some Super Saiyan 2s. As we start off, I think it's important to have a conversation on power scaling and lore implications for a scenario like this now, so we can waste less time hashing that out later, rather than expanding further on the story. This stuff usually runs a lot more subjective than I think many people are willing to admit, more so because Dragon Ball fans love to argue more than they do reading after all. The Android and Soul Saga was the first to draft the power level system the Saiyan and Namek Sagas introduced, so on top of adding a bunch of new impressive feats and transformations, it's also coincidentally the point personal power skills are most likely to diverge wildly between readings or interpretations of the manga and animes. I think the most important thing to keep in mind with my scaling, especially when it comes to power levels specifically, is that I usually base it off the trends the numbers took when they were first introduced, and I don't place as much value on the millions as I think most others do. We'll expand on that in a bit, but for now let's talk about the trend idea. The best example is the first one. Raditz rolls up in the 1500 range, then the very next villain is multiple Cybermen at the same level, then after that, a Saiyan way stronger than Raditz, and then finally the big bad boss of the arc. It's a pretty similar villain who outscales the first of the arc by literally more than tenfold, who mind you is also equipped with and willing to use an ability to make his strength increase by another tenfold. Keep in mind to be fair, the Powerball technique is meant to be pretty costly, so the assumption is that between Face and Kaioken Goku and the use of it, Great Eight Vegeta wouldn't have been at his full hypothetical 180k, but initially, as is the same way, he was going to use the moon if Piccolo hadn't destroyed it, and most transformations that change the body shape a ton are kind of implied to heal to some extent, like with Frieza's, though I can easily understand not really accepting that concept as a standard for every character across the series. But my main point is that Vegeta was meant to get so close to that hypothetical full power and Goku so far away from it, as he is the underdog low class Saiyan, that I think it's pretty relative. The safe assumption on solid facts being that we went from barely surviving facing a villain who completely shifted the literal power scale, found out he was lower than dirt, and then just barely survived again against the top of that hierarchy in a form where he was probably only a little weaker than Captain Ginyu. The sub boss of the very next arc we go to after going through another gauntlet who, mind you, literally wanted to trade up to Goku's body after seeing his 180k power level in the Kaioken upon arriving on Namek. And funnily, enough, the fact between Ginyu's 120k and Frieza's 120 million is a thousand, similar to the more than 10 times and then eventual more than 100 times difference between Raditz and Vegeta. And if we lump in Mecha Frieza with these so-called mini-bosses that introduce the next arc, it works even better, since technically, his cybernetics enhance Frieza's power to around the same as King Cold's, so it's actually more than a thousand times difference between Ginyu and Frieza as well, so the trend kinda stays strong with increasing at a vague factor over 10. So in short, this is what I mean by a trend, the first villain you meet in arc is super strong, but by the time you get to the boss, they likely will not have the same amount of commas in their power level as their weakest lackey who opened out the arc. And here's where my lack of a heavy value for power levels in the millions comes in. As you always see a lot of power level lists with the androids and beyond, and only the high hundreds of millions, and I gotta disagree heavily. Partially for reasons listed so far, but also because we've only heard stuff like the enemies characters are facing in the super era of the story aren't always flat out stronger than our heroes, but often are instead using their mind minds, bodies, skills, and key together a lot more efficiently than most of our heroes can think of at the time, usually learning to do the same as they go up against these new forces. So I don't think it works as an excuse to scale some of the Z antagonists past Mecha Frieza and the million still outside of maybe specific circumstances, because directly after Namek, having a power level of 150 million or less becomes simultaneously far less impressive and far easier to obtain in the grand scheme of things. Mecha Frieza and King Cold are both stronger than 150 million power level, Trunks is way stronger than it, and then at one point takes no damage from anything they try on him, while pretty much fighting as a joint force. I mean, they don't really tag team, but they may as well have, and if they had, it really wouldn't have done anything. And remember, absolutely 
truly tanking with no effect is a feat that Toriyama once said takes the defender twice the power of the attacker to pull off. And then Goku pulls that exact same feat off against Trunks to show he's twice as strong as him. And after seeing that, Trunks still stresses that Goku will need to be much stronger than he currently is to take on the androids. And this is all while having an estimate in his head for a set of androids who are actually weaker than the pair that we'll meet in the present. So the Z fighters as a whole still had to get even stronger than Trunks was stressing. My safety pick for that vague mecha freezing King Cold power level is always 180 million, since it feels in line with both the prior top numbers of the Namek and Saiyan sagas, and in line with the idea of setting a new trend with the mini boss, where Mecha Frieza is ironically the rightest to sells Vegeta. Or I guess if you wanted to split the androids and sell into two different arcs, you could make Mecha Frieza the rabbits to 17 and 18 Vegeta? Or no, I guess it would actually be 16's Vegeta, and then that way you could kinda treat 16 as the new mini boss for the cell arc. Kinda depends on whether you wanna set these based off who Goku ends up fighting, or just who anybody in general fights. This also works especially well since Mecha Freeze becomes the baseline the Z Fighters feel they have to reach in order to be relevant as Yamcha, Krillin, and Tien are presumably able to get there as well after all. And that's just the baseline, the goal was to get way stronger than that. There are also characters like Goku who presumably wouldn't purposely train their base form to be weaker than someone like Yamcha for the sake of only reaching a certain level as a Super Saiyan if that makes sense. Especially since Gohan at the time only had his base form, and obviously still got stronger than Chaozu, who didn't participate in the fight with the androids in Cell because he didn't get stronger than Mecha Frieza. And I really doubt Goku's base form would be weaker than Gohan's after training with he and Piccolo, especially since Piccolo goes on to put up pretty good numbers in the rest of the arc. There are always natural plateaus and such characters fall into, but Piccolo for sure definitely got stronger than Mecha Frieza, considering he was able to damage Dr. Jiro after he absorbed his energy, and Yamcha was manhandled by Jiro when that happened to him. I say all this obviously not to downplay the Earthlings in any way, but just to get us on the same page and remind how insanely impressive the androids in general are. To be fair, human ingenuity like cybernetics and mechanics in the Dragon Ball world are also marvels of creativity and power in general, because Toriyama had such an expressive way of coming up with fantasy engineering specifically, and he showcased it in just about everything he ever worked on. But in Dragon Ball, even characters like Major Metallotron and Aider back in the day were so noteworthy that Aider's pacifism is kind of more like Popo's, where it's there as a valid reason for the character not to solve a lot of our punch fighting problems just as much as it informs the character. So all this yapping boils down to a very easy to understand subject that we all kind of understand inherently by reading this title of the video. As I feel like while reading and watching the Android arc, it's something you kind of can't help but think about, especially since the arc as a whole is so heavily centered around Goku and his friends as a whole, and noting that the basic increase the average untrained human who can't sense or control their key at all gets from Dr. Jiro's android cyberification process likely takes someone from the single digits to the billions at the very least. Now whether it's singular, tens, or hundreds of billions could really just come down to what numbers you personally like more as the powers ramp up in correspondence to the trend I mentioned earlier, but this first part of the what if was just to touch on the concept of cybernetic enhancement surgery in both a better funded, research fueled, and equipped environment. It's not even exaggeration to say that the concept of a manufacturing entity like Capsule Corporation is probably one of the most technologically advanced ones in all of human fiction to date, but we are also talking about the procedure itself being done by an unequivocally better scientist than Dr. Duro in Boma, as after all, without her time travel tech, his ultimate creation in Cell is a lot less of a threat. Beyond that, she would even have better help than Duro ever would have access to in Dr. Briefs, which should also just allow her to do this a lot more safely and humanely for her friends. So, with more to work with and draw from on all factors going into the z fighters becoming androids, the basic increase they would get from the procedure would justifiably be a lot higher than what Jero's version brought about, since it's probably going to be a lot more advanced and closer to what Dr. Hedda would create if he were to try to make his own enhanced humans instead of artificial life forms. That being said, in Goten and Trunks' his little student by day, hero by night mini arc in the manga, we do see Hedda seemingly reanimating and augmenting human and non-human bodies which would imply that he could do even better and work with even less than his grandfather if he wanted to do the exact same thing as him. And both the movie and manga feature Hachimaru, whom remember, Hedo vaguely claims was created to be potent and powerful enough that it would at least in theory be able to completely incapacitate any of his grandfather's past creations with organic material, a statement which I do not think gets the shock and awe it deserves. Because as vague as it is, it could honestly mean anything from Hachimaru could kill someone as quote unquote weak as Android 20 or Jiro himself, or something as strong as 
as the original Cell, and more than likely because it's the version the rest of the world was the most familiar with. We're talking about the perfect version of Cell. This is a wasp, or a yellow jacket, or a bee, or something, dude, but either way you cut it, Hedo made a bug that he is fully confident would have the power, speed, and durability needed to easily catch and kill things his grandpa made, which took power beyond Super Saiyan to convince Lee defeat. Like, if the average human power level is 5, what is the average power level of an actual bug? Not a bug man, not a bug person, uh, like a bug. And not just that, but by its nature as a cybernetically enhanced organism, it probably can't have its key sensed, which is pretty massive in any kind of fight against it, especially if you've ever tried to box a hornet. And just an ability like that alone without a ton of strength behind it can be devastating if we look at fighters like Damon. And that's not even counting on the fact that this thing is basically just meant for assassinations and killing. Hence his high focus on tracking, stealth, evasion, infiltration, and poison. And not being fully mechanical would also imply that it could get stronger if it trained by the way, and based off 18 and 17's potential, thinking about this bug for too long begins to break the story a bit. Beerus' true rival and the strongest in the universe may have already risen up. Just saying, the scene of Hachimaru ducking on Krillin in the manga, even though it is meant to be comical and Krillin is the butt of the joke, isn't really meant to downplay Krillin who by this point after training for the turn of power and to defend the earth against Moro, is probably worth more than a few perfect cells in terms of power himself. I think it's more meant to back Hedo's claim since just about every other boast of his talent is proven correct by the feats of Cell Max and Gamma's 1 and 2 by the superhero film. However, Hachimaru didn't really get a chance to prove himself until the manga adaptation, since temporarily stunning Krillin is much more impressive than killing Magenta. So, mostly in conclusion on all our scaling talk, you take the fact that Bulma could probably do better than both Jiro and Hedo combined with her eyes closed, you add into that the basic idea of technique, fighting styles, and individual abilities and quirks brought to the table by an experienced and well-trained fighter who most importantly is consenting and willing to the procedure, and then you amp them up with infinite energy, you inevitably wind up with an android that's better suited towards fighting than the ones made without consent in a cave with a box of scraps. For instance, I really think we've all at this point thought about a Saiyan becoming an android, and even have certain fan stories out there already that explore the concept in depth, like Smug 6 Android Goku scenario. But because of how it works, android modifications can make even small things like Chaozu's telekinesis and Tien's four witches technique to be wildly dangerous, especially if their practitioners never get tired and become wildly durable, even by Dragon Ball standards. Here's a list of incredibly broken super moves some of the Android Z fighters can make use of. Tien probably has some of my favorite examples, so I want to start with him, because a four-armed, 20 crazy fingered Dodon Ray barrage that never ends alone could clap a ton of characters, considering it's an assassination technique meant to be stronger than the Kamehameha, which Tien can also use at full power near infinitely, by the way as he could with the Tri-Beam, which really is broken because the Neo Tri-Beam already nearly kills him, but if he could just keep doing it and doing it and doing it until he literally was just out of power, that's kind of all we would need. It's a hundred times his power, and his base power would have already increased, as we've likely surmised, over hundreds of billions. So even if Tien doesn't get you by himself, don't let him put you in a situation where you're pinned down, because then you think about the fact that androids work really well in pairs, and then he's going to likely have Chaozu there there and a telekinetic hole that never wavers while your strength is sapped trying to fight it, or even just the ability to self-destruct himself multiple times would make Chaozu incredibly cracked. Yamcha is a tricky, speed-oriented fighter, who just as easily could have used things like infinite wolf fang fists and after him strikes. Along with setups for things like the spirit ball, he'd be able to make a fighting style that could easily work well when he's either far stronger than his opponents, or when he wants himself and his allies to be nowhere near them. Yamcha is also great at distracting and running interference to be extremely strong at a support role, which we know androids can be the MVP of. Also, if Yamcha just really didn't trust in his own abilities before or after becoming an android, he could always ask Bulma for some kind of gimmick. And with as much cosmic irony as there is to the concept, I think getting energy absorption would be the most fitting. Mess around and let Buddy catch you in the corner with the Kamehameha Wolf Fang Fist, so he's draining your power and growing strong with each blow of the endless combo until finally, he just completely outscales you and decides to obliterate you with the blast at the end. Finally, Krillin is such a technique, effort, and focus-oriented character that ironically, like most of these changing the earthlings to be stronger concepts, he winds up being one of the ones I could imagine benefiting the most. Not just for small things like that kind of power would give him the boost and confidence he needs to keep trying to compete with his best friend Goku, as he was Goku's first rival after all. And by proxy, his confidence is one of the things that 18 is most attracted to him for, but also because Krillin is pretty much the reason we can assume 18 went on to become so much more dangerous of a fighter in terms of adding much more discipline to her fighting style outside of just being full of potential like 17. 
Queen is. It's one of the reasons her moveset begins to reflect his and not 17's so heavily, as he too stopped fighting like that upon realizing he had Frieza Syndrome and couldn't beat everybody with just raw strength. While in turn, 18 pushes Krillin to be more confident and trusting his full potential when he needs it. Because of that, his basic kit getting just an amp and the infinite energy alone is pretty massive to me, and as a point of reference, he could always pick up something new by letting Boma modify him as I suggest for Yamcha, giving him some kind of built-in gimmick. And shoutouts to Jojo Johnson for suggesting this, as again, they could all ask for some kind of android hacks and just energy absorption alone would be pretty broken on all of them. However, on Krillin specifically, I'd like to see either barriers or a capsule corp special and something Boma herself has invented but didn't really use all that much. If we think back to the Red Ribbon arc and one of Boma's first adventures with Krillin, she created her own shrinking technology and there is also the tech from the dino capsules or capsules that is about shrinking storage and sealing. So how about a perfected internalized device that could allow Krillin as an already puny but powerful fighter who becomes infinite more dangerous and hard to get a hold of to become even more so. Since if capsuling technology is included, Krillin could maybe get his own mechanical version of the Mafubla as well. Though speaking of, that's kind of another hack's ability for an android Earthling Z fighter, since they could also just keep using the evil containment wave over and over until they run out of power. Plus, Master Roshi is willing to teach it, and Tien already knows it. So as long-winded as I've been, in all, this is the expanded upon reason as to why I think Krillin, Tien, Yamcha, and Shaozu would be so wildly strong if they were to become androids. From just the raw power they'd get, to the confidence and faith in themselves and their techniques it grants, to the fact that our canon androids and artificial life forms already break the power scale multiple times throughout the Dragon Ball franchise. I'm not really done yapping just yet, though as I do want to mention, someone pointed out that with infinite energy engines, Cell could easily change his targets to the Z Fighters, which in this verse would make specialized versions of his perfect form, say if he absorbed Krillin, stronger than the canon version, since he'd also get their abilities and just a stronger android to absorb. And I don't necessarily disagree with this at all, as just an idea like this could really be used to expand a concept like this into a very long running mainline story. That being said, here, something like that would probably be evened out by all the other strong fighters around who would also improve the effectiveness of training since it's in general pretty beneficial to cybernetically enhanced people because I guess you could say once they get the amp they have a ton of untapped potential. This is certainly one of those points raised where if I or someone else were to expand on the concept for a deeper dive in a mainline story that has time taken and devoted for it, for instance stuff like Tien and Chao to probably not being super willing to take power they haven't earned and a bunch of other arcs and dilemmas like how Boma would feel about all this or how the Earthlings and their friends would cope with things and how Jerome and the Red Ribbon androids would come to terms with the Z Fighter androids. As I can imagine some great stuff in moments like Krillin bonding with the original trio while trying to negotiate with them and then maybe earning himself an earring like 17 and 18 after protecting the twins from Cell. I feel like those kind of scenes and moments could have a lot of weight but I also feel like because the stakes would be so heavily stacked in the hero's favor more so than they already are and canon by just the presence of plot armor, you would lose so much flavor in the story just as tension and suspense are just kind of removed. As those of you who really vibe with this scenario in the original shorts form have let me know and will likely continue to, there is a lot of great stuff that could be expanded on a lot better outside of shorts, and maybe someday when I have more time and resources to, I will try to. However, the exact same time, I really hope the concepts and ideas explored in this version inspire someone else to make their own take. After the threat of Cell is dealt with and 17 and 18 revived, things would seem to go back to peaceful, so normalcy is reached with a few key additions, with like 7 androids in the gang rather than only 2, and Goku getting to survive. However, I would wager with so many pumped up power levels egos and multiple people claiming the same category and vying for the title of strongest, be it Saiyan, android, human, or whatever else, we see the Z fighters all alive and well here, training in earnest, with some even entering the next best options of martial arts tournaments to the Budokai, so that they may test themselves. And thus, some epic rematches and new showdowns are possible, as Mr. Satan may even lose another claim to fame, or at least some popularity, though likely still maintains the guise of Cell's killer. Krillin as an android dating another money-hungry android would thrive most, as 18 and he would constantly be ramping up their strength to make sure they get two shots at the prize money they go after. However, to their shock, Tenshin and Shaozu have had the same idea, in the end causing an all-out tag match between the four android fighters, forcefully changing the rules of the small town turn, and in the end, seeing Krillin brought out on top, not because he's truly stronger, but because his bond with 18 is. The duel's axle dance allowing them to clutch the win, and serving as a good example that being an android alone isn't how you reach the top. 
with those kind of individual meetings over the time skip, we'd avoid any resentment or a lack of communication, as well as everyone's desire to enter the 25th tournament outside of Adele maybe, whom in this universe would be even more locked on to Gohan, likely knowing his name along with that of his family and friends after looking into their history throughout the tournaments and other villains like Cell and King Piccolo. Good old intergenerational obsessions. So as soon as becoming Gohan's classmate, Adele begins demanding his explanation of their insane powers, and after showing the tenacity of one with an infinite energy system already, she is successfully taken on by Gohan as a student and let in on the secret of android modification, more so to sate her curiosity than as suggesting or anything. Though a bit scared by the prospect, after meeting Android 18, Krillin, and most importantly Marin during the chaos of the Boo Saga, I think Videl would approach Bulma with a familiar request, tossing the two to flee the lookout and go deep into Capiscorp during the large clash with Boo, as multiple of Earth's strongest fighters are defeated and absorbed, with things still coming down to go on after a mystical ritual confronting the beast. However, in this timeline, as his newly made cyborg girlfriend shows up on the battlefield just in time to watch his back, the ancient evil would never be allowed to become Boo Han. So with the lovers Masenko, the duo do away with Boo. Quick interjection here. I know some people are like, hey, if they got that strong, how does Boo get out? But remember, Bobbity already got pretty far with a ton of strong fighters around who could have thwarted his plans just kind of by chance. So the implication is that he was fairly careful up until the moment he sent out Spopovich and Yamu, who he killed as soon as he realized it served the usefulness. Plus, I feel like the Boo saga already gets the short end of the stick when you have a Dragon Ball story like this one that is trying to inherently gloss over things. In general, Bobbity was actually pretty successful, up until the point of pushing his control over Boo too far. I don't think he gets enough credit for how capable, dangerous, and pesky a villain he was on his own by the fan base outside of say things like the what if he turned good by Moscow. Though to be fair, that is due to how much the various forms of Boo overshadow all other antagonists in their arc. So yeah, Bobbity could still totally pull slick shit, and Boo can still become at least a partial problem. More importantly to me would be Videl Scaling, however, since I could imagine that if I had done this series as a mainline story or even returned to it one day, Android Videl would be a plot point I'd have given just a tiny bit more since that's another one of those things that rings profoundly throughout the multiverse, as future Gohan was killed by androids, and never really got the kind of happy, earthling-like life that Videl kind of opened up to him. At the same time though, future Videl likely was as well, and she was kind of lightly fridged by the canon Buar, so I think Gohan training her into likely one of the strongest earthlings, since they and the Z fighters are stronger in this verse in general, and then by proxy, the new strongest android would be pretty fitting, giving her a strength and martial arts talent complemented by cybernetic enhancement to the point she doesn't really need to rely on any other inbuilt functions or powers like Krillin would, just the boundless energy needed to join forces with Gohan and stay by his side forever. Gohan and Videl then help Bulma to gather the Dragon Balls and then do Boo's Chaos, officially adding yet another powerful android fire to the Earth's defenses. But I really think Mr. Satan would feel some kind of way about both the destruction of Mr. Boo, the good bit he'd likely still have met the chaotic Jin, and the fact his baby girl is now a smoke and mirrors using quote unquote freak. Though with full context, I'm sure he'd be understanding. He'd still be uncomfortable for a while. Though as he sees Videl now happier and stronger than ever, able to stand outside his shadow finally, he eventually comes to peace with her being an android. Glad that she's glad. Though it does make him wish he were still strong enough to protect or maybe to have Mr. Boo back on their side. He even considers the android process, but he's still a bit too squeamish for it. Instead, going for a more basic and down-home approach and becoming Gohan and Videl's student, at least when the two aren't busy. That's when they pass him off to Piccolo, since that gives him a window into how to get his friend back, as he's met with the task of impressing and convincing Piccolo to allow him to collect the Dragon Balls and revive Boo, something I think even with greater strength he'd have a lot of trouble with, at least for now. Piccolo only being convinced into at least considering it, and seeing Hercule prove himself more than just talk, he may just relent one day. Now that an android has practically joined his family already, Goku is more than happy to welcome Videl into the Song Clan, almost convinced to pass her Chi Chi into becoming an android as well so she could be a sparring buddy again and have the energy to make even bigger dinners. Thus, as the time after Boo rolls around, Goku is also more than happy to be around the house to train with his boys and Videl, eventually even getting Chi Chi into the mix to at least train, as this inside of the family's money troubles will be solved by opening up a dojo together, where Hercule continues to train in secret. And just in time, his wedding bells now ring. A few years later, as everyone meets back up once again for Bulma's birthday, Lord Beerus has no reason to go to King Kai's world, as Goku and the other Saiyans are happily glued to Earth these days, and so he finds the planet a much more intriguing one, as even without Godly Ki, the Saiyans and cybernetically enhanced humans are powerful enough to keep the cat entertained, and with Videl's announcement of her and Gohan's child during the Super Saiyan God Ritual, Whis actually advises his lord to return to this planet rather soon, taking a keen interest in the future of this child even before any God Ki has been released. So the Super Era, the Z Fighters are said to take it on more than ever, as Goku goes on to give Beerus a far better fight earning his affection, in title of his newest arch rival. From here, more than just Goku and Vegeta would be invited to train with Whis, since most if not all the androids have continued to train and grow incredibly strong at a pace that has pushed the Saiyans far harder than the canon. Thus, as things are a lot louder, Beerus is awoken earlier to join in on the fun, seeing a visit from his brother Champa lead to a larger tournament of destroyers, where the likes of Kalifla, Kale, and a Namekian warrior are introduced earlier on to take on the Whis trained team of Goku, Vegeta, Gohan, Krillin, Tien, Yamcha, Piccolo, and surprisingly Videl, as Whis was more than happy to magic her through the birth of Pan and thus get her back into training early enough so the baby can witness her parents break their limits 
is in a battle with another universe. This being after they're missing out on beating down a resurrected Frieza. Thanks to these all being fighters, we still keen interest in due to their backgrounds as well as their power. The seventh blows through the competition, leading to Lord Zeno also being intrigued to have a possibly larger tournament than even this. At the same time, Yamcha thinks it's time they consider having Bulma try to tune up everyone's enhancements based on all the powerful new opponents they've met. Hopefully even invent some cool new tricks like some of the ones Warriors in the six have, meaning another guaranteed upcoming power boost. How about a short dedicate to talk about some of the cool gimmick powers the Android Z fighters could have? So I've obviously already touched on the concept of gimmicks and hacks for the Capsule Corp made androids, but in this part, the idea is a lot more directly addressed and considered. So just for the sake of it, we'll concretely go ahead and assign each of our android models with something special, with the assumption being that it's not something Bumble would be able to make standard issues of, so each and every one of her androids has all the abilities she's able to give any of them. Even though again, everything we know about Bumble and all her feats so far would suggest she can do that, and in the process could probably make her own ultimate life form, whose potential would probably make cells look like that of a Frieza soldiers. I still think Yonto with power absorption bulbs in its hands is a pretty good fit for him, but hey, if he wanted to take that to the extreme as the real cyberpunk of the group, he could get more of his body replaced by machinery and extended, so he could have booster and afterburners like Kakao, which he could use to further augment his speed or even fire attacks from. Ooh, and if you want to mix them, Boma could literally just install power absorption bulbs inside them, so Yamcha can never be overwhelmed by key attacks or kamikaze attacks again. As we previously touched on, Tien already comes with so many things they get amped up and made even more or broken by infinite energy, like his multi-form, the Mafuba, and the Tri-Beam, that he doesn't necessarily need something special from machinery, and likely wouldn't even want to accept it. Since technically, if his endurance is infinite, as long as he makes his power go up massively with continuous training, the multi-form could be about as dangerous as when we see Granola use it. However, if he were willing to accept an outside ability, it may be one inspired from 17 and Cell to create more complex barriers, which would be pretty effective for him, since the defensive ki used to be one of his signature techniques, and was one of his first major feats in the series. And if he doesn't take something like that, and then again even if he does since they could probably combo them together well. Giving the child would be amazing since he could have an even more dangerous version of MVP 17's moveset, except he could constantly cast hold person effectively, so everyone automatically fails their saving throws before he self-destructs on them. I forgot to mention it earlier, but there was a suggestion that if they needed another option, Krillin and Videl should get the ability to completely erase their presence, kind of like that one ability in Budokai Tenkaichi, but I think we should keep in mind that someone with key control could technically already do that, and androids themselves are already difficult or even impossible to sense, unless you're another android Android, with a specifically made internal scouter. That end, we've already came up with two paths for Kuhn, one where he kinda just copes at competing at a higher level by becoming an android alone, or he continues relying on his own human ingenuity and tenacity, allowing his enhancements to just be the icing on the cake. And though I still think she's very much the same way, I do think Videl could benefit from something like that, especially if the ability included a complete stealth mode that can even make the user invisible. Even so, I don't necessarily think they need them, though thinking about it, that kind of thing could maybe work a lot better for someone like Mr. Satan if he were to come in android, though I could also see him using the built-in capsule ability to load himself up with all kind of tricks and distractions, if played silly. To be fair though, Mr. Satan's potential wouldn't be far off from Videl's at all, since he is still incredibly strong by average Earthling standards, and would certainly make a powerful enough android on his own, especially after Roma has further refined her procedure, that way he could likely back up all his big talk. While invisibility would be an ability coveted by another Earthling who could also undertake the process to become an android, if things get dire enough. After this, the Black Saga would begin, however I believe another major change would come from Trunks, as after his experience in the present timeline, and losing Kibito and Shin pinning his train with the Z-Sword, he'd end up desperately asking his mother for an android enhancement himself, rather than focusing on another trip to the future, with this easier to pull off scientific feats and sacrifice possibly inspiring others in the resistance to do the same, especially after Future Mai for sure goes through it to better fight alongside Trunks. At that point, with a training partner whose energy also can't be sensed, and memories of the hell of synchronicity of 17 and 18 to guide them, Trunks and Mai could become one of the greatest fighting duels the multiverse has ever seen. Thus, inevitably, Goku, Black, and Zamasu are toppled, by the hybrid of Saiyan pride with relentless human technology, without the heroes of the main timeline even learning about the incident, and leaving Trunks' timeline fully intact and all the better for it. Preoccupying our heroes in the main timeline, however, is Hercules' eventual okay to revive Mr. Boo from Piccolo, impressed and convinced by both him and Videl after so long a part of the group. But how strong do you think a Saiyan android would be, much less one who's achieved power beyond Super Saiyan? As we touched on the idea a bit earlier, and are about to spend even more time winking off a hypothetical concept, I say the best way to open up this expansion segment is to quote one of my favorite comments from this part, from Fear the Pick Gaming. A Saiyan android is actually a very scary thing. Think about how strong a regular human with no fighting potential got with those augmentations. Now account for the fact that androids can also get stronger as they train, just like anybody else. Also, the infinite engine would actually be a massive boon to the Super Saiyan forms. An android Saiyan could potentially stay in any form as long as they want, as if they had fully mastered it. You could spam something like Super Saiyan 3 endlessly with that combo. 
Yes, yes, it really is scary because this isn't even to mention the concept of infinite energy being applied on top of the already discovered Master Super Saiyan 1, 2, and blue forms that drastically increase the power and efficiency of the forms. So far, less energy is wasted. So far, we're only talking about the fact that you really don't have to go through the process of trying to master your Super Saiyan forms with infinite energy. So that means even more than a regular Earthling android, you just kind of never stop as you are constantly pushed on to fight harder and adapt to tougher and tougher opponents by your Saiyan blood, while cybernetic allow your mind to literally overcome your matter forcefully. What you've literally just done is effectively created a Saiyan Terminator. Also, very quickly, should be mentioned, since his Kai training resulted in some light godly abilities in the manga and training under Super Saiyan Blue Vegeta helped lead to Super Saiyan Rage, there were a few comments from people who felt like Trunks would receive a downgrade by not having access to God Key, but uh, that's not really supported by anything we see from the series. The base android slash cyborg process alone is an amp to itself that enhances the gains you get from training so that alone, it's about as good as anything we see from God Key. Since God Key is, after all, the same as regular old Key in all functionality, outside of who can sense it, and even that isn't super consistent. May I remind, we also have Mule, a god of destruction who appears to be robotic in some kind of nature, and there are theories that he may be a little guy in a mech suit, but if he is, it either implies God Key can be used or channeled through machinery, and even if not, it's not like you need God Key to challenge or beat someone who has God Key, as we've seen a ton of fighters do so already, since it was introduced pretty much actually. Anyway, back on topic, this was my point in saying Trunks and Mai, who by the way would still be there as an android training partner, who was already stronger and more experienced with fighting than the average human, wouldn't really need outside help to be Black and Zamasu, even when dealing with immortality, because as I said, they would basically become a perpetual motion torture machine that would probably put Zami in a position of wanting to die and submitting to whatever fate Trunks deems is fit for him, rather than continuing to try and fight, since we know for sure Black would just get clapped, probably even with Rose. If the future team really did need help, I feel like there would also be other options like finding future Android 16 to try and get him on Trunks' side, since he should technically be even easier to soup up, or even having Mai's men get enhanced as well. Honestly, if they did that, an easy hacks ability for them would just be to give Mai the 6 pass in Renegon, so she can see through and command her squad with synchronicity and power of a well-oiled machine. Though thinking about it more, that along with the true self-cloning ability like Cells may be more fitting for Tien, but we've already covered him, and he would need less help to either survive or stand out in zone. As for Trunks, however, number one, Buddy would 100% take a hack's ability from his mom, partially because it is his mom, and number two, he like Goku will do what's necessary and use power that isn't his own, if it's what he needs to defend people and their hope and peace. Also, speaking of, his mother has one more piece of iconic technology that would tie that Terminator reference together perfectly, and she was already working on it again by the time Black showed up. It's the very thing Trunks would be suggesting she turn her attention away from, so when her procedure on Trunks is done, she decides to make him both the ultimate android and time traveler, by miniaturizing and installing the time machine's engine into Trunks' infinite energy core, in a design that would work by having the energy produced from fighting convert into time travel fuel, which just outright would probably make one of the strongest characters to ever come out of one of my what ifs or just a what if, regardless of if they're shorts or not. It'd certainly be one of the strongest versions of future Trunks I could even think of, including the Xeno version, since his potential is near exponentially higher. Hence, him not really needing help from Goku and Vegeta of this timeline, as honestly, this Trunk could be one of those noteworthy characters from certain timelines who Corona and the Time Patrol just can't pass up recruiting. As relative to how easily he could save his timeline, they'd be the ones in desperate need of his help really and truly. Which again, would be a wildly interesting conflict for a fuller story. Does Trunks purposely limit himself to wholeheartedly protecting only his Earth and his timelines he promised? Just like Gohan would encourage him to do. Or should he follow his pride and ambition and rise as the strongest Time Patroller in all recorded existence in order to bring peace and hope to all space-time, as Vegeta would? Whichever the case, I think he'd make sure his mom and Mai are by his side. But I must admit, Android Videla is only my third favorite concept in this scenario, with Infinite Hope Trunks being a close second, so you should definitely look out for what if Trunks became an android as a full story someday. Though there is some extra downtime for training and Boma's upcoming upgrades, it ends up being necessary, as even though there is only one Zeno in this universe, he still saw a big tournament, and thus adds for each universe to supply 15 fighters. The seventh currently boasts a team of Goku, Vegeta, Gohan, Piccolo, Krillin, Tian Shin Han, Yamcha, Capsule Corp upgraded androids 16, 17, and 18, Fidel, Chaozu, and even Mr. Satan having to fill in for Boo having fell asleep, and Roshi are brought into the fold out of desperation, with the once again resurrected Frieza being the last member of the team. Even with these beefier odds, with so many of Team Universe 7 unable to tie 
Empire and working together so well, they actually won with a bit more ease than they did in canon, despite our numbers disadvantage, since most universe was still likely gun for them, leading to Frieza being fully revived and allowed to go free. As the other things return to celebrate their win and continue their own progress as the conflict with Broly quickly comes up as well, and sees the Brutus Saiyan actually able to be subdued and calmed by Goku and Vegeta without fusion, being leaps and bounds beyond their canon selves at this point. Thus, yet another friendly Saiyan joins the fold and benefits from training with the Z Fighters and their many android members. So the next big bad or even if Frieza decides to pull back up, they'll be well if not overly prepared. As the threat of Moro makes itself known, we likely have a freshly revived boo to use against him, yes, but more importantly, with so many androids Moro can draw energy out of, we'd probably be okay if the big guy wants to take a nap, since I could easily imagine the grouping of 17, 18, 16, Krillin, Yamcha, Tien, and Videl just easily working the GOAT and his army in an eerily similar way to the way future Gohan got it, especially after they hear of Goku and Vegeta being defeated and having the energy drained. Hell, even Master Roshi and Hercule are finally willing to get enhanced, if at least temporarily, joining in on the fun fully, since this sounds a bit too much like the evils of King Piccolo and sell to them, and they were just the weakest members of their team of the T.O.P. Now as the technical latest models, they might be the strongest. All these fighters being pretty straightforward and serious, they likely would spare this even ancient or evil very little mercy, and thus, he very well may fall before the rematch of the pure saints could even be held. Leading into the granola of the survivor arc, however, the specification of strongest in the universe becomes much more intense than in canon as well, and thus, Goku and Vegeta get to make up for the lost battle, the bounty hunter pushing them further than they thought possible, and even further upon the advent of gas. However, when Frieza arrives, he still easily redefines the term strongest. I don't think there's much worth expanding on from these last two parts, but I do know there was a sentiment expressed that Goku and Vegeta should probably still have needed fusion, or that they'd begin to be left in the dust by all the androids. I'll just say, take that how you will, since he gets into the Jiren vs Broly debate I think should be long dead by now, but regardless, I feel like this specific Goku and Vegeta could probably fight it out on pretty equal terms with Broly, save Paradis, and then drive off Frieza pretty easily, or if they did struggle, it might be against Frieza rather than Broly, kind of in an early showing of what happens in the Granola arc, with Gogeta maybe having to save the Day. I say this because for one thing, I just think Whis's training would be way more effective since the way their android companions already operate and their experience mastering Super Saiyan form would probably make them realize the lesson about efficiency, control, and the discipline they use their power with way earlier than after they fought both Jiren and Broly by the time of Superhero. A lesson Whis has tried to impart since day one and which recently we've literally seen was able to help Vegeta overcome Broly pretty handily in the manga epilogue of Superhero. So yeah, Goku and Vegeta strong and Broly and Frieza strong. Pinning this, Goku and Vegeta take Broly and his crew, as well as Granola and Monaito with them for safety to shore up on Beerus' planet, going into hardcore group training to counter the gains Frieza has made, as they speculate that he too may have some hidden cybernetic augmentation backing his training. Meanwhile on Earth, the likes of Goten, Trunks, and Pan begin attending high school and preschool respectively. At the same time, another noteworthy descendant has made a milestone as he tracks down Dr. Jiro's lab and comes upon something interesting, the undisturbed and nearly complete gestating form of the present day cell. Studying and experimenting on his grandfather's work, he's able to reprogram him making him something in between the first of his own creations and an inherited refurbishing job. Dubbing the heroic insectoid bioandroid powered up from beyond Jiro's wildest dreams and freed of his basic predatory instincts, Common Cell, with the Bugman going on to be the cornerstone of Hedo's operation, and even having friendly clashes with the likes of the mysterious new heroes Saiyan Man X1 and 2, as they begin trying to track him down and figure out the mystery behind his creation along with Krillin and the police. This culminates in a final battle where Common Cell gives himself up in order to allow the Doctor to escape with his research. However, as the anti-hero Bugman is far too strong to be held in a regular prison, the duo decides to take him to Piccolo to figure out what to do. Piccolo figures since the boy is vouched for Common Cell and he doesn't have evil in his aura, he may as well simply keep an eye on him, and thus the wannabe superhero begins to live with him and even begins to help out with Pan's training when Piccolo is forced to pick her up or babysit her. However, when one day he can no longer feel the doctor's key and Piccolo and Dende fail to locate him, insisting they have to look for the naive scientist and prepare to save him. To this extent, I think Piccolo would relish the excuse to keep Gohan in shape possibly even being convinced into using Shinron to power up a bit earlier, grant him some extra time to master his new strength, and then use it to whip Gohan into shape, at least more strictly than Videl tries to. However, when they make the first wish on Shinron and have two left, Common advises another suggestion, with Piccolo cautiously agreeing to try it, and thus wishing for an infinite energy engine and a revival core like the androids and the original Cell had, resulting in Piccolo's power up being overall more massive, as he's even now able to help Common Cell reach his own power wicked form. From here, when they aren't searching out Dr. Hedo, they are grouping up with Gohan, Videl, Pan, Mr. Satan, Boo, Goten, and Trunks to spar and keep sharp, until one day, there is an appearance by a strange android bearing the Red Ribbon Army logo. Will they be ready in this timeline, or has Dr. Hedo made some advancements? When Gamma 2 is used as a test against Piccolo, he meets a lot more resistance sure, because both are stronger than canon, but Piccolo isn't being pushed into truly breaking his new limits just yet, so he fails to awaken that bit extra that Shinron gave him early, while Gamma 2 still has extra power from the advancements Hedo made while working on Common Cell, battling against the stronger ex Saiyan man and his increased funds, and so Common Cell quickly decides to team up with Master Piccolo to even the odds and drive off the Gamma, with the duo still faking defeat in order to track down the enemy base and gather the cavalry before storming it. While there could be a Gamma 3 or even 4 by this point to bolster their forces, the 
Red Ribbon Group instead are onto all the androids at the disposal of the so-called enemy cabal, tasking Hedo with creating countermeasures to disable them permanently, incapacitating a stark number of the Dragon Team currently on Earth. So with urgency, a stronger team led by Gohan and Piccolo will be ready to work together to deal with in a race to save Videl and their other friends, working to deactivate what they realize is a special nanite virus targeting cybernetic augmentations, explaining Piccolo and Queso's resistance to it, and forcing Magenta to panic as Dr. Hedo finds out the truth, deciding to help broker peace alongside Common Cell, at which point Magenta seeks to unleash Perfect Cell Max. Thanks to the experience of having worked on Common Cell, Perfect Cell Max is actually a lot more advanced and farther along in development than Cell Max would have been in canon, even programmed with data from the original Perfect and Super Perfect Cell in order to mirror his personality at the order of Magenta, making a finished product capable of speech and reason, and with a particular vendetta against Son Gohan and his entire wretched family, well and truly Common Cell's polar opposite. This sees the heroic bug try to stop his counterpart harder than anyone else, though he luckily has a team of other heroes like the Saiyan Man of the Gammas willing to work with him, even as they are outmatched. However, in his dark this hour, Common Cell is rescued by a new superhero, as Young Pan reveals herself, having gotten curious and come to peek in on the chaos, putting her vast potential and flying abilities to the test as she ends up just nearly getting Common Cell to safety, while Perfect Cell Max releases a devastating attack in order to wipe them all out and avenge his former incarnation. This moment of fear for their loved ones and the dire battle scene Gohan and Piccolo finally break their limits and achieve new power, standing against this menace as a duel to stop him. Dr. Hedo will inform the rest of the heroes their objective is to land a blow on Cell Max's head and make an opening to defeat it. Go on in his new beastly form, and Piccolo and his orange one bear unimaginable power, but possessing even more so, Perfect Cell Match clashes with them gleefully. While around them, the other fighters assemble, with even some of the recovered Z fighters arriving to lend a hand, do their best to hold down Cell Max long enough to hit his weak spot, simply diving through Master Roshi's infinite Mafupa, withstanding the likes of Mr. Satan and Boo's best combos, and even combined assaults from 17, 18, 16, and Krillin in an attempt for spiritual revenge against the original Cell, who tries to goad Gohan into a beam clash and seal his fate that way. Piccolo, Pan, and Videl desperately join him in the Kamehameha to support him. At the same time, the Gammas discuss a final desperate gamble, but over here, Common Cell tells them to allow him to take the most dangerous role, it, being their senpai after all. Feeling fear, Pan is telepathically told not to worry, as Common Cell promises that he's going to save her, soaring up, up, and away, and into the depths of space, until Earth becomes a pinprick, diving back down to build a speed intense enough that it chips away and damages his own body, forcing him to regenerate and burn with energy, until he crashes down on Cell Max, cracking his head and leaving him vulnerable for a split second, an opening large enough to be overtaken by the family's power. Perfect Cell Max is defeated, but not destroyed, since as a sore loser like the OG Cell, he seeks to take this task on himself by reverting to a lower form and proudly boasting he already took it upon himself to improve Dr. Hedo's failsafe self-destruct. Even so, Hedo urges the superheroes to retreat, despite hysteric cries from Pan and the Gammas for comment, as his exhausted remains still lie at the villain's feet. Laughing proudly, Max gloats that this time he'll go even further beyond to obtain an absolute victory, but the voice of Common proudly declares that he'll teach the villain what those words really mean. And in that moment, Perfect Cell Max realizes realizes his counterpart's nucleus has vanished from its remains for a true final gambit, as with the gifts of Dr. Jiro, Common tries to consume Cell Max and smother his explosion so it can't hurt anyone else, so when the light of their mutual destruction renders things over in a flash, it's more like one of transformation or fusion that Piccolo and Krillin are very familiar with, and when the group return to investigate, they find that there is still a Cell here. While the others go back on guard, Pan and Gohan look closer and quickly recognize their friend by the look in his eyes and smile on his face, and so the great Saiyan man says good job, hero, to the newly revealed Common Cell Max. So I left the superhero section of the story intact, mostly for the fact that more than likely, I will be cutting this section of the story up and redoing it just a tad, to rework it out as my own take of what if Cell survived and turned good. Since so much just kinda lined up like fate, for Common Cell to become one of those what if concepts and characters that instantly captured my heart, as again a ton just came together wildly well for it to work out, from my originally having gotten that art for the concept done on a whim and for a totally different story. To be honest, if I remember correctly, it was actually supposed to be used in the Piccolo story, but I don't remember exactly how I was going to have that come about. Also the fact that not long after I had it done, one of my favorite Dragon Ball fan artists, Alpha Makoto, did his own version of the concept, in a way that looked like the Common Cell I got made could evolve into the one he made, which just kind of made it seem meant to be. So keep your eyes peeled for that, and if it's already made by the time you're watching this, you'll find a link to it in the iCard, and it'll be one of the recommended videos by the end. Just like the Android, Videl, and Trunks concepts I've teased so far if they're out by the time you're watching this. With the Red Pharmaceuticals and Perfect Cell Max fiasco handled, it soon becomes time for our heroes to turn their attention to what comes next. As not long after things settle down back on Earth, Goku comes calling from his training trip on Beerus' planet, curious about the new powers he sensed and wanting to get Bulma to intervene in Granola's situation in order to stave off its premature death with an infinite energy system of its own. Then when this is done, of course a huge battle must be held to determine who is the strongest Z fighter, android or not, coming about as a rocket spar is held, in which we see the full capabilities of not only Gohan Beast, Nocha Instinct Goku, but also Common Cell 
Max, Orange Piccolo, Full Power Super Saiyan Broly, Full Power Granola, The Gammas, Ultra Ego Vegeta, and many more on account of just how many of our Z fighters are literally souped up here. Meaning in the end, whenever Frieza does return with whatever enhancements and advancements he's made, either through technology or training, the Z fighters will be ready and they definitely won't get tired, so they'll be prepared to go even further beyond and deal with any other threats that so foolishly want a piece of them. Well friends, from here it can only be pure speculation until we see what unfolds as the Super Manga returns and more than likely the Super Anime, hopefully. Since even here, Frieza would likely have changed and gained a lot of patience and greater self-awareness. Actually, especially this Frieza, since the odds would be so stacked against him, he'd be more incentivized to continue his training and preparing for a fairly long time, past even the original end of z prop inevitably coming to a clash between the Z-Fighters and the revamped Frieza Force, with that likely spilling over into the long-awaited true finale to Goku and the Emperor's original fight. I could easily even see it coming in a way where Frieza finally evolves to the point of burying the hatch with his enemies and finding peace in a role like Destroy God, as many like totally not Mark theorized could happen. If not something like that though, he could certainly wind up making an entirely new star system, universe, and multiverse to rule over, in the process of battling against so many enemies capable of utilizing infinite energy and the key of the gods. The possibilities themselves in this period of uncertainty that I make this video in are pretty infinite themselves after all. Meanwhile, following this hypothetical conflict, the Z Fives will return to the Earth for some more well earned R and R during the post end of Z era. As is the way with Dragon Ball's world, eventually trouble would arise again, be it baby, shadow dragons, or some new threat yet to be unveiled in the super manga arcs or movies. It could even be the antagonists of Daima, setting their plot to work after Beerus has awoken, instead of before. However, with their android abilities on top of their training and strong teamwork, the Z Fighters would always find a way to return the Earth and the universe to peace. And that's where we'll be ending the story in our look at this timeline.